Hello there, art nerds. Welcome to another start to finish tutorial where I take you through the drawing process, the inking process, and the watercolor process so that together we can complete a watercolor illustration in our watercolor sketchbooks. You guys will find a list of all the materials that I used in today's tutorial down in the description below as well as other relevant tutorials and playlists that I think you guys might find interesting. So I really hope you guys will check that out. If you just feel like painting along with me today, I shared the printable line art with my patrons at patreon.com slash natosoup. For just $2 a month, you will get access to all the line arts, all the classes, early access and backer exclusive to everything that went live that month. So if you like what I do and you want to help me continue to do it and you want line arts and early access and classes, I really hope you guys will join me at patreon.com slash soup. I have a thumbnail sketch here in my sketchbook for what I want to actually draw. I frequently work from these kind of really loose, sloppy little thumbnails just to get the idea out. And I'm keeping it by my side as I kind of sketch in the basic idea in my watercolor sketchbook. Once I've got kind of the basic composition copied over, I am cleaning it up and starting to refine it. And I'm using Pentel Red Lead in a mechanical pencil for this. So what I do is I sketch in all the major shapes, kind of adjust their placement, and then I start to refine things and kind of edit them as we go. Now I am referencing some fat froggos on the Googles, so I don't just happen to know how to draw a frog. I have an idea of how I want this frog to look in my head, but I am referencing it and trying to find a happy medium between like a really stylized froggo and a more realistic frog. I want it to be very cute and very cartoony as well as very approachable. So you guys can see I start with these really big basic simplified shapes and as we go I tighten them up and I add more details and I start by sketching everything in really lightly and then once I decide on the placement and what details I like and what I really want to solidify then I'm going to bear down a little bit harder on the pencil. Now I am sketching with 0.5 lead. I am a very heavy handed person. I am a pencil snapper but the 0.5 lead is great because it really forces me to lighten up or I'll just keep snapping the pencil. Also want to point out that Pentel Red Lead is fairly erasable, but it's more erasable if you keep it really light and keep it really sketchy rather than going in heavy handed. So one of the things I notice with my students when I'm teaching in person is that a lot of them want to go in way too small and way too heavy handed from the get go. Keep it as light and as sketchy as possible until you're ready to commit to it. And this is true whether you're sketching with colored leads or you're sketching with cola erase pencils or you're sketching with graphite or even charcoal. The lighter you keep it, the easier it's going to be to erase. I am going to ink this piece, but I'm not going to erase it again. The nice thing about the colored lead is it basically disappears once I start to add the watercolor over it. Once I'm pretty happy with my sketch, I'm going to start inking it and I'm inking it with a Sakura Pigma FB brush pen. Now in some of the other start to finish tutorials, I talk about why I like brush pens. I talk about how they are multiple line weights in just one pen. So I don't have to have a bunch of fine liners handy. I don't have to keep a bunch of other pens handy. This will do the job and it is both waterproof and alcohol marker proof. So if you're going to buy like just one pin for inking and really who can live with just one pin, this would probably be the one that I recommend. I've been using these for years. These are what I use for my October inking challenge and they're what I frequently grab when I'm inking standalone watercolor illustrations. So I have used these a lot over the years and I happen to really like them and I highly recommend them. So this is a great opportunity for me to point out that this tutorial has been time-lapsed by about 
for X. So um, my recommendations for inking are to take your time. Don't really try to rush through it. If you need to take breaks because your hand is cramping up or starting to hurt, please take breaks. I try to ink in pace with my breathing. So I draw the line as I draw in my breath or I draw the line as I release my breath. So I would really recommend maybe not talking to other people too much while you're inking. <laughs> people always wanna ask me questions when I'm inking and it's really makes it more challenging to ink. So if you can, try to carve out some quiet private time for this. Listening to music or a podcast or one of my tutorials can make for great company and just kinda of help you relax and focus. And I really find inking to be so relaxing and calming because of these restrictions it kind of carves out a few moments of calm and it can really just help me center myself and just kind of relax into it i would also recommend don't go into inking when you're really upset or you're really angry unless you want your line art to reflect that through hand tremors or through jaggy, uncertain lines. That might be something you're going for. You may want to work your emotion into your piece, but generally I'm trying to go for just very clean, straightforward line arts that scan well and reproduce well that I can share on Patreon or that I can turn into coloring books. So I'm not necessarily looking to bring all that emotion into my illustrations. Another thing about inking is the more you ink, the better you're going to get at it. So it's okay to start off and really not have an inking style, not know what you wanna do with your inks, not know what you want the end product to look like. If you're interested in getting into inking, I cannot recommend reading comics enough because inking is frequently, but not always, an integral part of the comic making process. And comic inkers and comic artists have to be very proficient with their inks because it is just part of the art form. So if you are not a fan of comics yet and you're looking for some recommendations, hit me up on the paint box, my art-centric Discord server, or you can ask me over on Twitter or even on Instagram. Just make sure you, you know, reference this video and also reference that I was talking about comic artists with great inking chops and I would be more than happy to introduce you to some comics that I think you will genuinely love. You guys know that I am a comic artist myself so I am also a comics evangelist and a pusher. I want everybody to give comics a shot so if you haven't tried finding a comic for you yet, if you haven't found an artist that you really resonate with yet, hit me up. I would be happy to throw some recommendations your way. I'm pretty well read and I'm pretty widely read. So I feel like I can find a good fit for you. So some basic inking tips, not to talk you out of looking into comics because I definitely think you should, but basically the heavier line weight is going to be in the areas away from the light source, or you may wish to use a heavier line weight on heavier, more solid objects, or you may wish to use a heavier line weight on objects that are closer to the viewer. We use a lighter line weight to indicate that the sun is hitting the object and to kind of break up the object's outline like the sun rays are hitting it. We also use a lighter line weight to denote lighter objects like feathers or like flowers or like moss or we use a lighter line weight to denote things that are further away in the distance. So, you know, a little bit of atmospheric perspective there, a little bit of lighting and contrast, and also thinking about the objects themselves and what feelings you want to convey to the viewer through your line art. So after I have inked the illustration, I allowed it to cure for 24 hours, scanned it, of course, and now we're ready to paint. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to have all the materials that I'm using listed in the description below. I am using my massive Daily Driver watercolor palette that I use when I am painting 7-inch Kara, my watercolor comic. I actually talk a lot about my Daily Driver watercolor palette and why I have so many colors in my vlog in defense of a huge watercolor palette. I'll link it for you guys. You don't have to use a palette this huge. If you watch, I'm not really going to be grabbing that many colors. A basic 12 color set will work well for this. 
So what I'm doing right now is we have our frog, our mushroom, and all these raindrops or all these dewdrops. So I am doing a little bit of an underpainting with some very basic local colors. And then I'm going to mask out our dewdrops. And what this does is it creates our lightest area of color, the areas that would be the hardest to paint later on with the dewdrops. And it also kind of gives us an idea of the color palette that we're going to be working with. But Spoiler, we have a brown mushroom, we have a bright green frog, we have some light purplish pink flowers, and then we have some darker green moss. So those are the colors that I'm going to be working with today. You guys also see that I am working with a ceramic weld daisy palette. You could use a plastic weld palette if you want to. Those are a little bit easier and cheaper to find. And I am also working with a ceramic plate. And I'm using the ceramic plate to mix the colors where I don't necessarily need to mix as much of them. And I hope you guys are watching how much water I'm adding to my paints. This is one of the reasons I'm often not as pulled in as I would normally like to be because it makes it harder for you to see what I'm painting when you can see the whole setup. But again, when I'm teaching watercolor classes, one of the areas that people really, really struggle with is they want to work way too thickly with the paints. They want to handle them like they're acrylics or like they're oils. We're really using a lot of water with our watercolor. That's why the water comes first before color is it's a lot of water to a very little amount of color. So with our flowers, I grabbed a little bit of a hot pink. I don't think it was like an opera rose, but I think it's like a compost rose. And I grabbed a little bit of mauve. I applied that and then I dipped some warmer yellow in the center and allowed that to bloom out wet into wet. Then I'm moving on to, they look like shamrock leaves. These are actually sorrel and those are sorrel flowers. And sorrel kind of looks like shamrocks with the heart shaped uh, trefoil leaves. And I applied some cool yellow to the base and then some hooker's green and let that bleed out. So for the moss, I have grabbed some green gold and you could really just use a cool yellow for this if you want to. I just happen to love green gold. It's one of my favorite colors. And you guys might notice I'm doing these really short sort of stippling brush marks with the moss and I'm trying to leave some of the highlight white of the paper. And I'm gonna fill in the main moss island as well as the smaller moss island. I am painting today in a Canton XL watercolor sketchbook and I went with this because it is a very affordable, very accessible watercolor sketchbook. You can find them all over the place. I have not tried the Grumbacher ones from Walmart yet, but I do have a couple of them. I'm looking forward to trying them, seeing how they compare. You can find them though at Michael's and many art supply stores. Um, you probably can find them at Hobby Lobby as well. I don't really go to Hobby Lobby a whole lot, so I don't know. But if you have a chain art supply store, you can probably find it there. It is a cellulose paper, which means our water and our pigments are going to sit on top of the paper surface. They may take a little bit longer to dry. But I am painting with this today because this is the kind of paper that a lot of people work with. And because this is a watercolor sketch, I am going to spend about an evening and maybe some of the next morning work on working on this. Whereas with my bigger watercolor illustrations or my comic pages, I can spend up to a week on them. And that is considered a very short time frame for most watercolor artists. But because I have a more cartoony art style, I can work a little bit faster in that way. So for the background, I wanted it to feel like a really cloudy, rainy day. So I grabbed some Payne's Gray. I also mixed in a little bit of this Marimari blue. It's kind of like a marine blue color. So if you wanted to replicate this color, you could do Payne's Gray with a little bit of a warm, dark blue. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, the background gray, if you're really stuck on it, would be kind of hard to replicate. So if it were me, I would just go with a straight Payne's gray. So I applied some gold yellow ochre mixed with gray to the frog's eyes, let everything dry. And now I'm applying my masking fluid. And you guys might notice I have my masking fluid in a small glass vial. You can get these at Dollar Tree. I am working with Winsor & Newton's removable masking fluid that is lightly tinted, makes it easier to see. I am working with a synthetic brush that I have before I started applying the masking fluid. 
I mixed some brush soap into it and this helps protect the ferrule and the bristles from absorbing the masking fluid and it ruining the brush. So it is a super simple trick. I have not ruined a brush since finding out about that trick. Now I am passing it on to you guys. You guys are welcome. I divvy out my masking fluid into small amounts like this because it prevents the whole bottle from rotting as quickly as it normally would. It is a natural latex product and natural latex does degrade and it does rot when exposed to oxygen and sometimes even when not exposed to oxygen. So by divvying it out to a small bottle like this, I'm only exposing the small bottle to the oxygen so it is less likely to rot. And I also find it a lot easier to work with than working with the whole bottle itself. I allowed that to dry fully. You want it to go clear. It is actually going to become more visible because the yellow that they add to, you know, make it visible when you add the masking fluid is going to become more prominent as the white kind of turns translucent. And then I'm adding another layer of our Payne's gray with a little extra to the background to really start developing kind of that misty rainy sort of look that I'm going for with this illustration today you know just proof that rainy days are wonderful to frogs rainy days are not terrible days it just depends on your perspective and your point of view so we've got a cheerful and chipper little frog here just enjoying it living his best life so I'm going to start developing more of our colors now. I added another layer to our sorrel flowers. I am adding some Quinn Gold to his eyes and dipping in just a little bit of brown and letting it blend out. Because if you guys look at frogs' eyes, they have this beautiful kind of mottled thing going on. I am also adding another layer of our brown mixture. It was probably burnt sienna with a little bit of burnt umber in there to our mushroom. And I am also grabbing some more brown and I'm going to start dipping that in somewhat wet into wet on the mushrooms cap. And I am also referencing this mushroom as I paint. I apologize. I don't remember what mushroom I'm painting. And I am adding in some Van Dyke brown and working that in wet into wet and trying to let the brush strokes replicate the surface texture of this particular mushroom. So even though I have a very cartoony art style, oh, and I'm using a wet thirsty brush that I've removed the excess water from to remove some of the excess paint. So even though I have a very cartoony style, I really like working with reference. I like practicing different brush strokes. I like trying to replicate the textures. I really like trying to combine a cartoony, approachable, very friendly style with some more advanced watercolor techniques. And hopefully that encourages you guys to paint along with me because remember, it's not just about loose watercolor florals. Watercolor can be all kinds of different things. While the stem is still wet, I'm also dipping in a little bit. It looks like maybe I grabbed a little bit of Indian red as well as some of our burnt umber. Now for the moss, I am using a particular color. I'm using Daniel Smith's Undersea Green. This is a super granulating color that granulates out into these blues and browns and golds. And it's really beautiful. And it makes for a really, really nice moss color. It is like one of my favorite colors and it is my go-to for painting moss. And you guys can see that I'm still doing like the little stippling, super short brush strokes. If I were painting an animal with short fur, I would use a similar sort of brush stroke. And then while it's still wet, I'm grabbing a thicker, more saturated mix of the paint with my brush and just kind of working it in to some of the shadow areas while it's still wet. So we get these softer, more diffused shadows. So something that isn't really shown too much in YouTube or time-lapsed watercolor videos is the amount of time it takes for illustrations to dry. So cellulose papers tend to dry depending on where you live and depending on whether or not you have air conditioning or a fan going or not, tend to dry a little bit faster than cotton rag papers do because it's all surface evaporation. I'm in Southeast Louisiana. We're going through a little bit of a dry spell when I was painting this and we had the AC on. So my dry times were really very short. But we cut the dry times out of the videos because who wants to literally watch paint dry? But I think that's something that people who are not really familiar with watercolor, who are interested in getting into watercolor, they're not really familiar with it. 
and it can take you by surprise. So with this kind of like watercolor sketchbook illustration on a paper that is a little bit more finicky to work with than a cotton rag paper, at least in my opinion, in my experience, I am doing a little bit of wet and wet, sure, but this paper doesn't really take that so well. So I'm also really letting my layers dry before I start painting additional layers on top of that. I'm not really trying, unless I say otherwise, I'm not really trying to go in to an area of color while it's still wet. But you guys will also see me jump around on the illustration. And that's because I am, while one area is drying, I'm moving on to another area and kind of working on that area. And that allows me to work a little bit more quickly. It does make doing tutorials a little more challenging because, you know, we are jumping around a whole lot. But it also allows me to demonstrate that I don't really finish working on any one particular area before the rest. I really develop my whole painting as I'm going. So I mixed in a little bit of Diox Purple into our mauve and pink mix just to start painting in some of the shadow on the flowers. I'm also using the gray that I mixed for the background to start applying some shadow to our little froggy friend and then blending it out just a little bit to kind of soften some of those shadows. I'm going to add some more brown to the stem of the mushroom. Again, I am referencing this mushroom. So I'm trying to translate what I see in the reference photo into this more cartoony art style, which is, in my opinion, such a fun challenge. I really enjoy drawing in a more illustration-y or cartoony style. I don't find realism to be really that exciting or appealing to me. It's cool to be able to recreate something perfectly, but it is so much more fun and more memorable to me to take what I see and interpret it and try to show you guys just a little bit of how I see the world. So I'm adding another layer of Van Dyke Brown to the cap using kind of chunky brush strokes, kind of mushing that round up. You could use a variety of different brush shapes and get different textures and get different brush strokes. And that's really an area I want to push myself in more and experiment with more. But I have found that rounds like I'm using today are good all round um, they are very flexible. You can paint a lot of different things with them. They are great for watercolor comic artists and illustrators because they are so flexible and capable of doing so many different things. They're just great workhorse watercolor brushes. So that's one of the reasons I really recommend them. I have tried a bunch of different shapes. I have tried a bunch of different brands and I just got to go with what works and what clicks for me. And that's what I recommend. So for the moss, I grabbed a little bit more, maybe a a little bit indigo blue it's kind of hard to tell maybe I grabbed a slightly darker bluer green both would work for this I mixed it with my undersea green and now I'm starting to paint the shadows on the moss I also grabbed some more warm yellow and I'm adding it to the center of our sorrel flowers I'm also going to paint our sorrel leaves now. I want to leave some of that beautiful wet into wet that we got from earlier. So I'm leaving some ridges and some highlights, but I'm mainly using the hooker's green and kind of filling in the center of the heart shape of the flower. So you get, not the flower, the, the leaves. So you guys can see a little bit of that wet into wet underneath. So with a cellulose paper like this, you're not going to get the really beautiful transis, uh, transparent layering that you would normally get with like a cotton rag. So it does take some adjusting and some getting used to. I am applying, it's Sennelier's yellow green. It is a really bright, vibrant yellow green. You guys absolutely do not have to use or buy this color. I like this color a lot, but it is not a color I could see everyone using all the time. So you could achieve the same sort of color by mixing a very cool yellow, cool opaque yellow with like the teeniest amount of phthalo blue. And I am also painting some hookers green on top of our little froggy friendo here. And I'm going to try to leave some highlight areas and try to blend it out. This is where I started to kind of struggle and ended up doing a lot of overpainting and painting too much because the Sennelier yellow green is pretty opaque for what it is, which makes it great for adding these bright, fresh pops of highlight and rim lighting color to foliage. 
not so good as a lower level color, like a baseline color that you've applied as thickly as I did on a cellulose paper. It's not so receptive a base, but we are here to have fun. We are not here for perfection today. And perfect is often the enemy of finished. So we're going to let it dry. We're going to work on some other areas. We're going to think about it and think about ways to fix it or if we even want to fix it while I'm filling in another layer on the background. Now I wanted to create a gradient for the sky where it's darker at the top. So I am applying it up to a certain point and it's not really like a neat in point and then I kind of brushed it down with some clean water to kind of create an ombre effect. So on these kind of cellulose papers, you don't necessarily get the really clean gradients that you might get on a cotton rag paper. That is just a property of the cellulose. Sometimes you can get some really interesting kind of weird dry lines on it. So if you're going to paint on cellulose, you really just have to lean into the peccadillos that a cellulose paper has. It is not going to do what a cotton rag paper does. You shouldn't expect it to do what a cotton rag paper does. That's how you're setting yourself up for disappointment. So while the background dries, I thought to myself, well, I will go in with some more of our hookers green. You see, I'm working from a couple of reference photos of beautiful, well-fed tree frogs and I really wanted to capture the range of color, the range of yellow to green to blue green that you get on these frogs. Can you tell that I love frogs? I wanted to be a herpetologist when I was growing up. I'm also adding in some yellow ochre to the belly. They get, they've got this kind of like cream color on their belly and in some areas it almost goes like neon yellow and I'm really trying to capture that here, even if I am kind of overpainting the frog on a paper that is not super receptive to this kind of overpainting. So you guys are going to see me apply paint and blend out paint and lift out paint and layer over paint. And um, I'm pointing this out to you guys because I, this is not something I think you should like replicate in your own. If you have a way of handling paint for frogs that you like better, go with that. If you're referencing frogs and you want to handle it differently, go with that. I'm just sharing my adventures with you guys so that you guys can hopefully learn from them. Adding another layer of our hookers green to our sorrel. And then while it's still wet, dapping in just a little bit of phthalo blue, especially in areas where there would be shadow. So like behind the flower to really kind of make the flower pop or adding that contrast. And then I'm adding in just a little bit more of our dioxine purple to create some shadow and to kind of give some depth to the illustration so it doesn't feel overly flat. Just because it's a cartoony or illustration, it does not have to be flat painted. You can paint it however you want. You can go with a flat painting, like a gouache-like look or a very simple watercolor if you want to. Or you can try to do what I'm doing and try to balance the really cartoony, simplified art with layers of watercolor and layers of texture and a little bit of nuance. So I added some more Van Dyke Brown to the cap of our mushroom. We're really trying to capture the ridges that we're getting in this particular type of mushroom. And I'm grabbing a little bit more pink because I felt like my sorrel flowers went a little bit too cool and a little bit too purple. So I want to try to work that back by glazing some pink on top of that. Going in with a little bit of a warm, it could be burnt sienna, it could be Indian red, it could be Venetian red, it could be burnt umber on the stem of our mushroom. And there you go, you see, trying to blend some of those areas that got a little bit soapy and got a little bit caked up on our frog. So this is another opportunity to talk to you guys about professional grade paints. All of the paints in the palette you guys see here are professional grade watercolors. I am working on a student grade paper today. If I were working with student grade paper, a uh, student grade paint on a student grade paper, I feel like I would be having a lot more trouble with the layering and with glazing and with adjusting the colors and just kind of finessing it into place. Student grade watercolors definitely have their place. I think they perform a lot better on a cotton rag paper than they do on a cellulose paper like this. And basically, if you're going to cheap out, you can cheap out so you have your paints, your brushes, and your paper. 
I feel like you can get away with cheaping out on one of those aspects. In this instance, we're cheaping out with the paper, but you can't cheap out with more than one because then it really starts to become a struggle and it's not as enjoyable a process. And I am really having fun painting this watercolor illustration with you guys. I love frogs. I love mushrooms. I love painting dewdrops. I love flowers. So this is like all of the things that I love right here. And I'm just kind of playing around with the paints and adjusting and blending out and trying to juggle the semi-realistic with the watercolor, with the very cartoony of the the art style and I'm not really focusing on how to make this work um, with the frog a little bit because again I kind of messed up by choosing the super opaque Sennelier yellow green as like an under color and not diluting it enough and that wasn't really a good base to put these other colors on but in general I'm not really thinking about how to fight the colors into getting them to do what I want I'm just kind of playing around with them and glazing them and seeing what the painting needs and seeing where I can adjust things so I let everything dry fully totally and completely and then I can remove my masking fluid and I'm using a masking fluid pickup or a masking fluid eraser eraser or a rubber cement eraser you see it's sold under a bunch of different names you can often find them in the model section like model car section because they use them as well I get mine at Dollar Tree in the craft section and I like some people can use their finger and just kind of rub at the masking fluid and get it to come up my hands are always super dry that does not work for me the masking fluid pickup is like a booger made of masking fluid and like wants to stick to like makes it a lot easier so after I have removed all of our dewdrops, I am going in with it's that Mare Marie blue color I'm so sorry I don't know the name of it off the top of my head I've had the tube for like 10 years and I'm trying to make myself use it um it's a warmer darker blue so it does have its usage um, it's darker than say an ultramarine blue and it doesn't granulate in quite the same way but honestly an ultramarine blue would work fantastically for these dew drops uh, that would I that's what I would normally use if I wasn't trying to get myself to use some of the more neglected colors in my palette and uh, we basically filled up most of the center of the dewdrops, leaving a little rim of light at the top or wherever the light source is going to be. And then I'm going to paint another layer of the local color on top of that. And that's kind of how I like to handle dewdrops. So I added another layer of brown to the stem of our mushrooms. And now I'm going to start adding that local color to the center of the dewdrops. It doesn't have to be 100% spot on the main color of what you're painting. It can be like a prior version of that color and then it'll kind of look like the lights refracting through the dewdrop and kind of lighting up the area underneath. But you really, you really don't have to get like super specific and persnickety about it unless you are painting hyper realistic in which you go, you go little rock star. But I'm basically doing kind of approximate local colors and I find that that works well enough. as it dries you may decide you want to go back in and add more local color you may decide that you're really happy with how it looks and you don't want to fuss with it too much it's really about what you want from this and developing your taste and what you feel good with and trusting your own art intuition and the trusting your own art intuition is the really hard part especially for me where I tend to overwork a lot of my illustrations because I have this ideal in in my head and sometimes it's hard to kind of reconcile reality with what I'm going for I mean it's good to have an idea of what you want your illustration to look like like what colors you want those sort of goals but if you have too strong a schema of what you're going for in your head it can be hard to reconcile and love what you did paint when it doesn't look quite like that schema. So my advice for that is to put it away for a few days or a week where you can't see it and then come back to it with fresh eyes and see if that helps. 
So at this point, we've got everything kind of blocked in. I am just kind of finessing and zhuzhing things, really kind of getting the dew drops and the raindrops to look the way I want them to. This is, again, about trusting your art intuition and kind of what you want from the piece and what colors you want to bring in and what you want to convey with this illustration. I just wanted to paint a happy little frog enjoying a rainy day underneath a mushroom next to some sorrel flowers. Like I really wasn't trying to go super duper deep. So with these kind of cellulose papers, everything sits on the surface. If you did an inked line art like I did, it can start to look kind of um, obscured and muddy. So you may decide that you wanna re-ink certain areas just to bring that contrast and that clarity back in that's what I'm doing I apologize that my face is so in the shot uh, my eyesight is terrible and this is something you do actually want to get like really up close on and I don't like working through the viewfinder of my phone to uh, try and ink things that's just so imprecise so you get to see some of my face but this is some artist realness not you know aspirational art where <laughs> Sometimes you wonder how anyone makes art that way because it's like, man, the filming setup for that is just so convoluted and just gets in your way of seeing what you're doing. But that's why it's like a TikTok and Instagram real sound right now to be like, look how quickly I finished this because I wasn't recording the whole process. That... There is some truth there. So after I adjusted the contrast by re-inking it just a little bit, I am going in with some white gouache and I am kind of reaffirming our rim light and just kind of adding in some highlights. So I am gross and I will just dip my watercolor brush in water and then dip it in my white gouache tube to grab the amount I want. I find that I waste gouache a lot less by doing that. I am also mostly a watercolor artist and not really a gouache artist, so it really doesn't get contaminated with other colors or polluted so it is a method that works for me and it is less gouache going down the sink than if I were like to squirt out a little pate it also lets me work with a little bit drier tubes that have probably seen better days because I am reconstituting the gouache in the tube as I'm using it rather than trying to extract the gouache onto my palette so you know however you like to work should work for you I also decided to add a little bit more contrast to the cap of the mushroom with some sepia brown just to add some more shadow mainly underneath the dew drops. So together we have completed another start to finish blank page to finished watercolor illustration together. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I hope you guys found this helpful, useful, and 
in, you know, informative. I keep wanting to say inspiring. I also hope you found it inspiring, but my brain wanted to combine informative and inspiring into a garbage word that would mean nothing. Yay, ADHD. But I hope it did all of those things for you guys. And I hope you are feeling excited to use your own watercolor sketchbooks to get to drawing, to get to painting, to get to inking. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You got to make a lot of really bad art to make some good art. I mean, so much bad art that we frequently just don't see on social media because I mean who wants to share all their failures but do not be afraid to make mistakes to use your paints and to have fun with it because to get good at watercolor you have to do those things and hopefully I inspired you guys to do just that today huge thank you to my patrons on patreon you guys have the printable line art for this if you want to just paint a along with me you can join me at patreon.com slash soup this channel has no other sponsors besides my amazing patrons they fund the things that I do here on the channel so thank you guys so so much I hope you guys will check out some of these other great tutorials and I hope to see you guys again soon